Hello everyone, today I am Lily and I Ami, will be presenting our capstone project on a topic that is both exciting and innovating. And the topic of our capstone project and our scientific paper is the development of transparent wood technology as a glass substitute. So in the recent years there has been ongoing concern over the environmental impacts of the current uh, building materials as, such as concrete and steel. And researchers have been examining new alternative uh, substitutions for uh, the current <coughs> building materials to, to make them more eco-friendly and sustainable. One of such materials is wood. However, wood has its own legs. It is, is not transparent. And here comes our research. We have been examining um, wood fabrications that would result in wood transparency. But before moving on to our experimental part, let's just briefly go over why do we need a substitute for glass. So, transparent wood, uh, for the um, advantages, transparent wood is better biodegradable material. Instead of shattering, it bends our slippers. Um, it's five times more thermal, thermally efficient, it, and the protection results in low carbon emissions. However, it has also its disadvantages. When used in high-scale production, epoxy resin is used and it's not environmentally friendly. And it is difficult to, to mass produce because its component is produced in different time frame. For the glass, it is easy to maintain with basic cleaning tools and it's long lasting obviously, but it produces heavy carbon footprint and it's not as thermally efficient as food. Um, so before, again, moving on to the fabrication part, let's talk about the structure and composition of wood to, in order to better understand what we did. So here's our wood. It's kind of similar to the picture here. Um, the outer, the first two layers are called outer bark and inner bark. The outer bark is there to protect our wood from the outside world, so it's a losing moisture or drying out or insects in general. And the second part is the inner wood. Its main purpose is to deliver a uh, resolved mineral to the rest of the wood. Uh, next is the sap wood. It has more cellulose content. It is softer and has less density as opposed to hot wood, which is the darkest part of the wood. And it has lignin. We will talk about lignin shortly. But to emphasize what I'm going to talk about, let's just know that lignin is responsible for the dark color of the wood and for the mechanical strength and stiffness. So basically, more lignin means darker color. And the vascular cambium is basically the boundary between each layer and the center part is called pith, which is the oldest part of the wood and it has tendency to crack. For the composition of part, as I've said, uh, wood is composed of cellulose and lignin. However, it has also hemicellulose and small content of other extractors and inorganics. Um, while cellulose and hemicellulose are colorless in the range of visible light, um, col uh, lignin is again responsible for the color because of its uh, absorptive properties. Uh, 80 to 95 percent of, of the UV light that is reflected on our wood is absorbed by lignin, and it gives our wood the dark color. Um, so lignin is the second most abundant organic polymer on Earth, and it is the largest natural source of aromatic monomers. And because of its wide range of properties, it can be used in a variety of industries, not only in construction. It can be used as a biofuel. Uh, it can be used as a bioplastic, as a asphalt uh, pavement modifier can be used in wood dressing and tissue engineering and as a substitute for vanillin. And now I will talk about how to modify lignin to achieve transparency. <coughs> so the basic chemical process includes two steps. The first step is the lignification, meaning the removal of lignin overall. Uh, so there are many uh, the lignification methods used in uh, uh, industry. So first of uh, first one is poplar vinyl fabrication, so, uh, sodium hypochlorite solution, solar assisted chemical brushing, fabrication by polymethyl methacrylate, bio uh, based Lyman acrylate monomer method. So basically, there are many methods, and 
we have considered uh, different drawbacks and advantages of using each method and de uh, decided to go for solar assisted chemical brushing. Uh, so why di uh, did we choose this method? First of all, it is <coughs> it is relatively environmentally friendly compared to the other methods that I mentioned. It has low chemical usage, meaning there are no, uh, uh, very few chemicals are required to conduct this process. Uh, there is no requirement of using high, temp uh, high temperature. Uh, a very good advantage is that it does not modify cellulose, meaning it only modifies the lignin part and does not harm the other polymers existing in wood. Uh, there are less waste and toxic gases uh, in this process. However, this process also has its drawbacks. For example, uh, although I mentioned that uh, this method is uh, relatively environmentally friendly, use of hydrogen peroxide may generate harmful byproducts uh, if the experiments are not conducted carefully. Uh, compared to the other method, methods that I talked about in, in the previous slide, this, methods is, uh, this method is relatively so, slower. And uh, the effectiveness of this method highly depends on the type of wood that is being used. Uh, so the actual uh, uh, process of solar assisted uh, chemical brushing is the following. First of all, 0.6 to 1.5 millimeter thickness wood samples uh, are being immersed into sodium hydroxide uh, solution. Uh, afterwards, they are being Im uh, immersed into a uh, hydrogen peroxide solution. Uh, so in the next stage, UV light is required to continue the experiments. In our experiments, we used uh, a sun, uh, direct sun rays uh, to be more environmentally friendly, but in, uh, but in papers, we can find that uh, UV lamps are used as well. And uh, after exposing to sunlight for one hour, uh, the wood samples uh, are put inside ethanol for five hours to remove additional chemicals from the wood samples and receive the pure transparent uh, delignified wood. The next stage uh, after delignification is uh, called polymer impregnation or polymerization. Uh, from the image, we can see that uh, this part is before delignification and the right part is after delignification. So before delignification, uh, 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 left part is before polymer impregnation and the right part is after polymer impregnation. So the del del uh, since uh, lignin uh, is a polymer, it is filling uh, the inside skeleton of the wood, uh, wood meaning that uh, so is the uh, base of the wood base skeleton. So after delignifying the wood, there are many holes and pipes uh, left inside the wood structure. Uh, so the, in simple words, it, uh, polymerization is a uh, process of filling in uh, that inside structure to maintain, uh, to increase the flexibility, optical properties, uh, water resistance, and other physical properties of the wood. So uh, the wood will be stronger uh, and lose its stiffness before uh, that was because of the lignification process. Uh, so the ba uh, ba basic polymerization, uh, polymerization is the following. Uh, epoxy resin, which, uh, which, are which is a polymer, is being mixed with its curing agent with, uh, at ratio one to two. Afterwards, uh, the wood samples, the already delignified wood samples are immersed uh, uh, are being brushed with uh, epoxy resin and uh, used under atmospheric pr uh, uh, pressure for 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, basically, it, uh, it is advised to use vacuum pressure for this uh, process. However, uh, since uh, we uh, do not have a, va a vacuum chamber equipment, uh, we used atmospheric pressure and afterwards we used press uh, to uh, uh, to merge. Uh, so afterwards, uh, after that press, the wood samples are cured to remove from the pressing material. And uh, Lilith is now going to talk about the actual experiment we did and the results. Now coming to the part that we've all been waiting for, our experiments and results. So uh, we conducted our experiment with the process that Hike mentioned earlier. 
So we uh, chose various types of wood from pear, apple, oak, and some nut trees. And as you can see, each of them has different color, also different thicknesses. So the first picture you see here is the <coughs> wood samples after being immersed in hydrogen peroxide and left in the sun to be delignified. So we did the delignification two ways. First way was brushing them with hydrogen peroxide, and the second way was immersing them in the hydrogen peroxide bath. However, we didn't see significant difference between the two ways. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, the picture, uh, first picture was them in the hydrogen peroxide bath, and the second picture is them uh, after being dried and ready for the second round of the delignification. Uh, this is our samples after being delignified, and as you can see, uh, decolorization has already taken place from the first uh, actual wood product that we had, and the right hand side is the wood after delignification. Uh, also, you can see that darker color uh, wood has also gone to delignification and decolorization. Uh, lighter ones as well, and the thickest one as well. However, due to contrasts, uh, it's not very visible. Uh, so we wanted to see how much transparency they have achieved. And as you can see here, we have the darkest samples of our wood, and a uh, significant difference is visible. Uh, after delignification, we wanted to see if our wood was has achieved transparency and if we could read through our samples. So we put our, uh, our sampled wood on paper and tried to read through them. And as you can see, uh, both samples, the light color and the dark color, it have achieved significant amount of transparency. The darker colors are more readable. Uh, however, the lighter colors are more blurry. The reading is more blurry and translucent. Uh, we have an uh, issue here with the darker colored wood samples because they require more delignification and it's time consuming. And if it was in the uh, industry and fabrication, uh, this would be a constraint. That's why we decided to omit the darkest and thickest samples of wood and work with the lightest samples we have. Uh, after the delignification process was done, uh, we saw uh, that our wood had achieved transparency and we could assume that polymerization was not required. However, uh, polymerization is also important because lignin is also responsible for the wood's uh, stiffness and uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical strength. So the first uh, sample here, you see all of them are from the same batch of wood and the first sample is the initial state of wood without being delignified nor polymerized. The second picture here is the wood after the lignification, while the third picture here is the polymerized wood. So the uh, right hand side uh, wood, uh, part of the wood is only uh, delignified, while this part is already polymerized, and you already can see the significant difference between them. So coming to our constraint and future works. So uh, we faced a few constraints. The first thing was the unpredictable nature of sunlight and the low uh, solar intensity since we conducted our experiment during springtime. Next was not having required equipment such as <coughs> vacuum chambers and a press. So we conducted our experiments in atmospheric pressure, uh, atmospheric, uh, pr atmospheric <laughs> environment. Uh, the next was that the wood samples that we had were uh, hand prepared, therefore they were uh, with a rough, with a rough uh, edges and uh, not uh, as, smooth as, as smooth as we wanted them to be. Uh, next was the absence of material science laboratory. Coming to the future work, we want to extend our delignification and polymerization processes. We want to test with various types of wood. With the reports that we have read, they used balsa wood. However, we wanted to use wood that were available in Armenia. And uh, last but not least, testing for material properties of the wood. Here are our acknowledgments. <coughs> we would like to thank our engineering department, our program chair, and the dean. Moreover, we would like to thank our 
supervisor, Felicia Kocharyan, who was there uh, with us from the first day for his constant support. Uh, and here are our references that we have used. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, first off, it's quite a complex and uh, big project, and I think you guys did a really great job in this, putting all the parts together because there are different um, aspects involved in this. What I'm curious to know um, is the thickness of the samples you used from the original wood until you got your um, last result. So we used uh, our sample of various thicknesses, ranging from 0 0.6 to 1.5. 0.6 yes. to 1.5 millimeters. Yes. yes. Um, what I would be curious to see, actually, um, a resulting sort of a graph, um, trying different, different thicknesses mm -hmm. uh, processed throughout the same amount of time, and then the same thicknesses processed until you reach full transparency, sort of saying and then see the penetration depth or the absorption rate, kind of a graph, and see how that, how the thickness of your sample gets affected with, with the process. Mm -hmm. That would be really interesting to see, I think. Yeah, we'll see that in our future works. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but we have already tried our, uh, we already tried samples on thick wood as well. However, we mainly c focused on the thick uh, thin ones because in the fabrication in the industry you use in the future, the lack of time and the multiple delignification is not equipment. Yes, mm -hmm. equipment also were a problem. So that gets me to my last question. Do you think the time needed to, to get to the end result is the bottleneck in this whole process? Like the most challenging aspect, the most challenging processing stage, is it getting some specific material or um, having sufficient sunlight or some pressure chamber. I mean, I saw the pressure chamber yeah. is, is, uh, is a challenge, but say you have, a, you have all the equipment, all the material you need, what would be, in your opinion, what would be the bottleneck in this whole process? Uh, so basically, uh, if we have more time with the equipment, we would go some time different than I thought. So compared to the effectiveness, compared to how they are transparent, the, the uh, transparency changes depending upon the method, uh, we will try, uh, it would be very help, helpful to uh, have some kind of equipment that, will, that would observe the chem uh, physical structure of the wood, how it changes after each delignification step, after the polymerization step, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we observed anything, uh, everything we did, we did only visually, we, just, uh, we couldn't... Uh, we didn't see any changes in the microscopic level. Microscopic yeah. microscopic yeah. level, that would definitely help. Good, good, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, really quick question. <coughs> would you call this plastic wood? We, uh, we can be, uh, in some context, we can be immersing plastic form of polymer inside here. Because if you keep on doing it, yeah. you'll yeah. actually have plastic yeah. that's not on the wood, I guess. Almost. Yeah. Yeah, what kind of scientific equipment do you have used at all? Because if I, I couldn't see any data produced, what kind of transparency you have achieved and, uh, and uh, mechanical properties, have, how have you measured? Yeah, uh, that was our concern, one of yes. our concerns because we didn't have equipment. Uh, I mentioned that we didn't have uh, the vacuum chamber and also press to conduct and we didn't have material science laboratory to see if these uh, properties and do our research even, uh, to do our experiments even deeper to see uh, and have better results. So we just went with the equipment that, that we had we in our uh, chemistry lab. Yeah, exactly. So that was good. <coughs> so Maybe I can add to that question. For example, you said we had significant increase, decrease in luminosity. But you're an engineering sciences student. If you have the equipment to measure these things, what kind of an equipment would you use to measure this? Or what kind of a setup would you need to actually quantify the transparency that you have achieved? Uh, so first of all, we will uh, have a look at the uh, change in physical structure after each chemical process we did. Uh, so that would help 
uh, to understand whether polymerization worked effectively, whether delimitification worked effectively. So all, all of our uh, conclusions were based on uh, visual effects that we noticed. Uh, so I understand. So what tool would you use to replace the visual effect <laughs> with numbers? Uh, so basically, uh, a very important thing to measure is the uh, temperature factor measuring. So uh, we need to understand how much uh, heat uh, is lost uh, after it, be it is being tra uh, transferred to the transparent wood. Uh, another. Uh so basically, there are cameras that capture the wood Automatic. structure in a microscopic level. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, they are, um, they are called SEM uh, cameras, <coughs> but we don't have that in our VA. Uh, actually, our I can see the, uh, show the image. Yes, and this will be the result we would have achieved if we had the camera. Just yeah, there is some uh, microscope in Armenia, <laughs> one of the chemi chemistry institutes. Okay, so you could have done better researching what kind of scientific equipment is present in Armenia. The guy next to me has yeah, a, vac a vacuum chamber, chamber uh, mechanics institute, a few hundred meters down the road has enough equipment to measure mechanical properties. My advice would be just look around what you are missing and uh, try to find out, okay? I just wanted to add that the nuclear load is probably a spectroscopic material for the transparency 